fellow Falcoholics, what is up? Welcome to episode 149 of the Falcoholic Live. I'm your host, Kevin Knight, joined by my wonderful co-host tonight, Evan Birchfield. He is at the very easy to remember, at Evan Birchfield on Twitter. Evan, how are you doing tonight? I am great, Kevin. Um, Nothing is really happening in the world of Falcons, but uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk i guess about what's kind of happening so yeah you know what is or isn't happening is the topic of discussion tonight and to help us Mm -hmm. break it down we have friend of the show special guest randy havens he is at mr randy havens on twitter star of stranger things among other projects randy happy to have you back on how are you doing tonight hello hi and welcome (laughs) to me and welcome to you as well. I love that the show started with just me sitting in silence yes. beside you. Yes, it was like, like I'm talking about Evan that. and just, you know, it just decided that it, you were going to yeah. be the one that was shown. No. But, you know, we I don't get to decide. I got one of those faces. I know. Yeah, it's, that's that's why you get the to make the big bucks. You know? <laughs> exactly. That's why you're on, you know, on TV and we're on YouTube. No. <laughs> no. But uh, thank you for coming on, man. We appreciate you. We know you're uh, a rabid Falcons fan and... Last time we had you on, you had to share the stage with about 30 other guests at the same time, uh, which is, you know, not the best. So we're going to give you an ample opportunity to get your takes in this evening. Kevin, it's the life of a character actor. <laughs> you know, you get one of those one of those lines and then you got to sit there while the, the other guy says about 30 of them, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Reminds me of an audition I did once. I, I did do a little bit of acting when I was in high school, but uh, so I... I vaguely remember some of those things but uh yeah it, it was a good time it's a good time enjoyed it um but yeah guys this is a falcon show so we're gonna save the rest of the acting discussion for a couple weeks from now when we do our acting pod um but uh yeah so uh kyle pitt signed that's really the only bit of news and evan was astute enough to remind us all that it is the uh the falcons anniversary of becoming officially an nfl franchise other than that not a ton going on um, obviously with Kyle Pitts officially signed, we have a, a firm idea of exactly how much cap space the Falcons will have left. They haven't been very quick to utilize any of it. So it seems like they're kind of content to sit uh, and wait maybe until camp or to see if a particular player shakes loose that they like. Uh, but otherwise guys, we'll talk about that stuff a little bit. And then we're going to get into some defensive position battles, talk about, uh, some of the top most interesting things there, obviously edge is a big one, cornerback pretty wide open as well, and then more about who's lining up where on the defensive interior, those are kind of the most interesting ones we'll get to, but we'll also be answering your questions, obviously, guys, so feel free to throw those in there as well, but uh, yeah, Kyle Pitts is officially an Atlanta Falcon, you know, officially official, not like he was going anywhere. But uh, Evan, any any takeaways? I mean, the rookie contracts these days are basically just a formality. But uh, are you feeling any, a little bit more comfortable now that the the class is officially fully under contract? Um, yeah, because I think they were one of the last ones not to have signed a single player until Julio was yeah. gone. Yeah. Um, which was kind of like a bad sign. But now they don't have to worry about all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's good that it's over and everybody's gotten paid and we'll be ready for training camp. Mm-hmm. Yep, always nice to hear. Always nice to to have everyone signed. It was getting a little bit uh, exciting there for a minute while we were waiting for everyone mm-hmm. to get signed. Uh, I know some fans were like, so what happens if they don't sign by training camp? And I'm like, well, let's like not figure that out. Let's not get there. Uh, yeah, there are protocols for now. that. It has happened rarely, but we don't have to worry about that now. Randy, was oh, there wait, ever? Wait, wait. Oh, go ahead. Go uh, ahead. I just want to mention there. We'll talk about it later. There was other news. The uh, I can't believe I forgot the uh, helmet news. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I'm. I was um, gonna leave that one for you. Yeah, because that's that's. Your I wheelhouse. almost forgot. I yeah, that's forgot, your wheelhouse. So. Yeah, we'll get to that one right after this. I, Randy, was it ever in doubt that the draft class would be signed? Are you are you more are you relieved now that Kyle Pitts is officially under contract? Uh, yeah, I wasn't really worried that they weren't going to sign, <laughs> um, Mr. Pitts. Um, uh, I was actually surprised. I was like, why, what, <laughs> like this hasn't happened already. Right. Like what, what, what was going on? I guess there was some maybe negotiation going on. I don't know. Is there like, there is like a little I mean, bit of negotiation that can happen, like around how much of it is signing bonus, how much of it's guaranteed mm. and that sort of stuff. Um, I believe it was like wasn't last year maybe the year before with um nick bosa or 
the, one of the bosses, but he was a. Uh, there was like a lot of drama around the contract because he wanted the part of the contract left out that said like if he got suspended they could void his guarantees and that was like a big contentious thing um but like other than those little formality sort of sorts of things uh it's pretty much like this is the range that it can be and it's just kind of figuring out what part of the range you end up in yeah no i I definitely was not uh scared that he was not going to get signed um so I'm like, <laughs> we got rid of Julio. You're yeah. not you're not signing your number one pick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, it wasn't really in doubt, but uh, they needed the money from the Julio trade, apparently, to get it done. So at least we got one good thing out of it. But, um, I mean, we haven't even heard, honestly, your take on the Julio trade. So if you have, I mean, I'm sure you have some thoughts on it. I, I know, guys, we said we wouldn't linger on the Julio trade for long. Uh, but I did, Randy, you haven't had a chance to kind of sound off on it. So I, I am interested in what you what you thought of that. A deep, deep sense of sadness. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> I appreciate it. Short and sweet. That's pretty much what I, what I had to say, except I had to stretch it out into like three 90-minute shows. But yeah, yeah. I like that. I like that very summarized uh, version. And yeah, uh, I'm also ready to move on from it and, and, you know, remember happier times instead. But uh, Evan, tell us about the helmet change, which was uh, hinted at by another great guest um, Mm -hmm. that uh, kind of, you know, quote unquote, didn't really break the news, but really did break the news that it was coming. So yeah, uh, tell tell the people what the the change means and and when we can expect to maybe have uh, the red helmets making a comeback. Yeah, so um, what Kevin was mentioning was Brett Jukes, who was on our show in, I believe, April. I know it was before the draft. Yeah, I think Um, it was early April. Yeah. Yeah, he he basically was like, uh, you know, there's this rule in place. We can only use one shell. So that means, like, you'll see, you saw teams like the Dolphins and the Falcons, I guess. I don't know why I was going to use the Dolphins as an example, but the Falcons, how they were able to use the throwback black helmets, where it was the same helmet, and same texture and everything. They just put it on a different logo. But a lot of teams like, um, let's say, uh, the Eagles, mm. if they wanted to use their Kelly Green um, old, I think, 70s, 80s helmets, it was a brighter green, so they couldn't do throwbacks because mm. they had to keep that same color, um, which wasn't a color until the mid-90s, I think, for them. Yeah. Um, so now that rule's gone next season so this season ever like you'll still see the falcons not have a red helmet and stuff but um in 2022 they'll be allowed to have an alternate so you know from what brett was saying and he's you know one of the top dudes with the falcons and you know has played a big part in the uniform design and all that um he said that pretty much they're all fans there of the red helmets and that uh basically when that rule went away the red helmets would return and um it sounds you know like that could be sooner than later since the rule's gone in 2022 and i saw in the nfl memo that the nfl um nfl teams have to notify the league by july 31st of this year um like what helmet they want to do for next year because everything happens in advance right so we may hear something about the red helmets, you know, in next month, um, which I'm hoping for, because that would be great news, even just to hear like, hey, they're going to be, you know, part of it in 2022, because he basically also said that they had um, red helmets in mind with, I think, the the gradient ones, I think he mentioned or something mm-hmm. like he, yeah. he mentioned that there was like some plans for red helmets. and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. um you know, I think that's pretty exciting, and I know some people care more. You know, I'll see. Oh, I just care about winning, and that's cool. But you want to look cool on the field too, like right? That's you know, that's part of it, and that's. Yeah. I mean, for me, be, becoming a Falcons fan, that's what played a big part of it, part in it. Um, when I went to a game uh, when I was six years old, I saw I loved the um, black helmets and black jerseys. And I thought that was cool. And that's why I became a fan, not because of a certain play or anything. So, <laughs> yeah. Know. Look, kids make decisions based on jerseys, man. That's a fact. Okay. There's no shame in that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, the Falcons color scheme definitely helped matters. I mean, it was mostly Vic for me just because that guy was impossible to ignore. Right. But, uh, you know, the jer- the red and black was a big thing as well. So, uh, 
you know, Falcons have long had some of the best jerseys in the league, particularly in those Vic years too, uh, with the black primary and the red as an option. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm excited to see. You know, he did. Jukes definitely talked about incorporating a red helmet into the gradients, and that was honestly like something they planned. So I'm interested to see how that looks too, because um, I think the gradients came out on the field looking a lot better than folks had thought they might. Um, oh, I'll be, I'll be one. I thought I was like, this is going to be awful looking and they look pretty good i thought so yeah yeah i mean very few teams have done the gradients well you know you look at Mm -hmm. jacksonville disaster um right a lot of teams just they don't execute it well they try to get like too flashy with it and i think the falcons using the black gradient the the black is is a good one to do especially when you kind of incorporate it into the whole uniform and not just a jersey um you know i think that was that was smart uh, Randy, what did you think of, of the gradient jerseys? Were you a fan or not? Uh, yeah, definitely wasn't a fan when I saw like the pictures of them or whatever. But yeah, they mm-hmm. don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't mind them. Yeah. Yeah, and it's once a year. It's not yeah, like a it's. A, yeah. I think if it was yeah. like every week, it'd be a little different. Like that's the problem with the Jaguars when they had the. I think it was black, and then it like went to gold. Um, it looked awful, but you saw it every week. Um, if they did it like one week, it would have been like, okay. But I mean, I thought the gradients looked good that one week. So as long as it's like once, you know, once a year or whatever, I don't see a problem in it. Yeah, exactly. I just, just, it's it, even if you don't like it, I think you can put up with it for a week. So, you know, that, that's kind of where we are with that. But, uh, yeah, it's gonna be exciting to see the more uniform combinations. And I know the fans that were upset that there wasn't like a, a red throwback or more of a red primary look with this with these new uniforms um will hopefully get their wish when they see the uh, the red helmets make a comeback uh after this rule change so we're not going to see it till 2022 guys just to clarify like it is still a year out but it is on mm-hmm. the horizon now officially instead of just being like something that's whispered in, in nfl back rooms or something like that so um definitely excited about the jerseys um all right well Let's get into the wait, defense. Expi- wait, explain yeah. this to me. Cause, cause yeah, yeah, I, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm dumb. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> those red helmets that they just like showed off aren't gonna. They don't. Oh, oh, you you're can't talking about them. Yeah. Okay, right. So what you probably are referring to is they shared an image from yeah. Bleacher Report. It was like a Photoshop of helmets yeah. that they use. There's leaks and stuff, but that wasn't the exact helmet. Um, I don't know the specific specifics if it's um, because the. The current helmets are more of like a uh, jukes use like a certain word, but it kind of looks like a matte helmet instead of like all glossy and shiny like that red helmet was. And that's what like their older throwback helmets were. It was more of like a glossy red helmet. But the black helmet they used last year was still that matte helmet. So I don't know if that they're going to do that when they bring the red back or if they can have just a totally different like texture to the helmet. Because that's what would have to happen for that look, which I thought I, I like the shine, but you know, yeah, yeah, the mat was definitely interesting. But it's just like yeah, like they can't actually have the second helmet until twenty twenty two. They were just, I guess, announcing the rule change now, so teams can yeah. prepare for twenty twenty two. Um, their their uniform designs and things like that. Because I think all of them have to be like approved by the league and all this stuff, and it's all right. very very bureaucratic and red tapey. But um, you know, I'm excited for them to uh, hopefully launch soon uh and i guess it is you know we don't know exactly what the the uniform will look like at this point but um Mm -hmm. i think if you've seen the throwbacks you know from their original years you have a pretty good idea what it's going to look like at this point and they they still have the red pants that i Mm -hmm. still want to know how that's going to work because of the the striping on the side um yeah um i think it's black or whatever and it just there's no other black stripes up the jerseys right here it's all red or Mm -hmm. white i think yeah. Um, so I have no idea how that's going to work unless you have two colors clashing into each other. Right. Maybe they'll just make another white jersey that has the black stripe instead or something like that. Probably. Um, that would be, I think, the easiest thing. Just a quick little, you know, change. Mm-hmm. So hopefully something like that. Because, yeah, I think if the colors clashing, I think it would look really weird. But, you know, yep. we'll see. We'll see. But, uh, yeah. All right. Defense talk. Uh, last week we talked about the biggest offensive position battle spent a lot of time on guard center. Um, you know, now that 
Matt Gono was expected to miss some time. We spent a lot of time, you know, talking about the, the possibility of, you know, Jalen Mayfield maybe getting moved to swing tackle and that sort of stuff. So if you missed that talk, definitely go back and watch that from last week where we had Keenan Forney on to get into the offensive line in depth. Um, we're going to switch to the other side this week talking about the defense. Um, and I want to start with the edge group because I think that is the the point of biggest concern on the whole team in terms of depth. Um, and it's basically wide open in terms of the depth chart. Like they, they added a lot of sort of, I would say, middling players uh, to compete. And like, I don't think it's going to be a, a terrible edge group. I just don't know that there's any huge difference makers here. And we're kind of depending on Dante Fowler to uh, really, really step up and, and be that guy that they, they paid him to be last year. Um, and, you know, with his contract getting converted basically into now a, a one-year deal, essentially, with next year getting voided, you know, this is his chance to prove that he deserves another big contract from somebody else. You know, not necessarily out of the question that Atlanta could resign him if he has a good year, but um, outside of Fowler, there's just a lot of names. Uh, so, <laughs> obviously, they they drafted uh, Adeto Kumbo Ogundiji um, late in the draft, you know, on day three. Uh, a guy that they like, a guy that's versatile, can play a lot of roles. They signed uh, Barkevius Mingo, uh, who has, you know, played a rotation role in the past. Obviously, high draft pedigree, didn't really ever play up to that standard, but someone who's certainly capable of, of playing rotational snaps. Uh, Steven Means returns, who has been a very reliable edge three, edge four sort of guy for the Falcons, particularly as a run defender. They also have Jacob Tuati Mariner still from last year, uh, who was kind of a pleasant surprise. Um, he's probably the favorite, I would say, to start opposite Dante Fowler. But some of the other names we have here, a couple of undrafted guys, Kobe Kobe Jones, uh, or Kobe Jones, uh, Sharif Miller, who they just signed recently, and then George Obina from Sacramento State. We could also see, you know, some of the other guys mix in there, like uh, John Kaminsky, uh, Marlon Davidson played edge in college. You know, it's possible he could be out there. And then someone like Michael Walker, who we don't really know exactly where he's going to line up, um, listed as an inside linebacker on the roster, but has some edge experience as well. Um, so, Evan, I'll give you the, the first crack at this group. Um, who do you see as the guy opposite Dante Fowler, or do you think it's going to be basically a, a big rotation of guys throughout the year? Uh, I Hopefully it's... Uh, Mariner because I think he's paid his dues and you know when he really gave uh, was it given like time to start I thought he flashed um do you think there's a chance that it's somebody who's not on the roster yet because I'm kind of yes. leaning that direction yeah okay. I do um you know and we'll see what they do with the because, cap space oh, just but, to finish yeah. uh none of these other guys I really have any faith <laughs> in aside from yeah. like Steven Means I think could be serviceable yeah, but, and Ogandiji, yeah, obviously. Yeah, they're hoping. They right, can turn into something, right. But. They're hoping. But if this is what they're rolling out with and it's not um, Mariner starting, uh, hopefully it's somebody they've added because if that's what they roll out with, it's going to be more of a let's see what these guys can do sort of thing, which, uh, I mean, that's not usually great for success. Um, so, yeah, I hope it's a free agent currently. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a fair assessment as well. Uh, Randy, do you have a preference out of those guys? You know, would you like it to be someone like Twati Mariner, maybe the rookie, uh, or are you hoping for another free agent addition as well to kind of take on that second edge spot? Uh, yeah, man, I <laughs> I want someone on that first edge spot. Um, uh, <laughs> that's yeah, fair I like, too. Yeah. I like Twati Mariner, Mariner. I like um, Kaminsky. Um, I feel like. Hopefully, uh, old Dean Pees, um, is a better judge and like utilizer of talent than we've seen previously. Um, I feel like we've had sh players that have shown like a lot of promise that are just like they just sort of get relegated to the sidelines, um, yeah. for whatever reason. Is it that, that you know, like, like we've obviously like you know, don't see everything. Mm -hmm. But I don't I don't feel like in years past that uh, the best players were necessarily on the field. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I don't have a lot of faith in Fowler um, because he's, you know, like he was on the <laughs> other side, you know, like 
with LA, he was like on the other side of a beast. Mm-hmm. And it's like, how many times have the Falcons done that over the years of just like, we'll get the guy who's got all those sacks. That's not like the beast on the team. And it's like, wonder why he got all those sacks. Cause the quarterback was running away from the other guy. Yep. Yeah. I mean, um, like, yeah, I mean, as good as Grady Jarrett is, he isn't Aaron Donald. So mm-hmm. Clay Matthews had like eight sacks that year. Yeah, sacks. And then he didn't yep. get signed the next year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's just been out of the league. I think so. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Randy. Yeah, it's a good point. And, you know, the Falcons, I think, have been notorious for that, you know, with Ray Edwards, too, just like they don't sign the guy. They sign the other guy to be the guy. And mm-hmm. as you know, you might expect, the other guy is still the other guy, <laughs> not the guy. So um, it's just, man. And that's, they fell for it again with Dante Fowler. And like, I think we all hoped for the best with him. But um, just Dimitrov's instincts for signing edge defenders were just so bad. Um, yeah, when you're when you're desperate, it's you know you make moves like that, and that's like when your job's on the line. He knew his job was on the line, so he was mm-hmm. desperate. And you know, yeah. he wasn't Fowler, gonna have to Fowler pay for does, it, you know, if it didn't work out. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. And Fowler made some good monies off of it. So he did, he did. Yeah, and like I, I, I like Twadi Mariner. I think he's an ascending player. Um, mm-hmm. you know, very similar to John Kaminsky, which, you know, is why I'm like wondering if they're going to deploy Kaminsky a little bit more on the edge, which is the position he played in college. Um, because Kaminsky is a freak athlete, like an absolute freak of nature. Um, his three cone is like absurd. It's like on par with off, like off ball linebackers and stuff like that. So, um, it is, it's going to be really interesting to see who ends up with that second spot. Um, and maybe we can talk about some of those free agents that are still out there in just a second. Let me read off a few donations real quick. We got $3 from George Stanza. George, thank you so much, brother. We appreciate you. He says, I've always been a Falcons fan, going back to our previous conversation about the jerseys and the throwbacks. He said, I grew up always wearing number 58 for the hammer. Very good choice. He says, the Falcons were awful in the 90s. It was hard to be a fan. Man, I, I, I'm lucky that I was too young to understand pain from losing games at that point. So I didn't have to suffer through that, but uh, I got on the train of like actually caring in the Vic era. And there, there were some crushers in there, but man, I, I feel for you guys that had to to sit through that. Yeah. Like you said, the Falcons were so bad from, uh, you know, 70 to 98 and I didn't have to deal with that. I came in at the tail end of the badness and then uh, got to have all the good times. So uh, I can only imagine you, you diehards out there uh, sticking with the team. You know, you guys are the ones that have been here the whole time. So we, you know, we feel for you guys. <laughs> like, we think we've got it bad. You know, we had 28 to 3 and we had a couple of hardships, but at least we can say that the team was like competitive since we've been fans for the most part. And yeah, that, that stretch from, like you said, 70 to 98, I mean, pretty, pretty bad stuff outside of a few good seasons here and there. So that's rough, man. But uh, appreciate your donation again, George. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Um, we also got Ray Moon with the $5. Thank you, Ray. We appreciate you. He says, How serious do you guys. How seriously do you guys think the coaches will take the preseason? Um, it just depends. Some coaches don't care at all. Like if you watch Dan Quinn, he gave zero shit about the preseason. <laughs> and it, it showed, you know, because they lost almost every game while he was here in the preseason. Not that winning preseason games really matters, but I mean, they got outplayed a lot during the preseason too. So um, other coaches care a lot. Uh, and I think the best scenario is probably somewhere in the middle where you you try to, to win and you try to play well, but, you know, the outcome isn't that big a deal at the end of the day. You just want to be competitive. Um, But, yeah, what do you guys think? Do you think it's – how seriously do you think this new staff is going to take the preseason? Because Arthur Smith seems like a guy to me that might take it seriously because he is such a hard ass. So what do you guys think about that? Uh, Evan, you can can kick us off. Yeah, um, I think because, you know, it's his first season – being a head coach and having all the new staff with, you know, a lot of coaches he hasn't worked with, he'll probably take it serious. Um, He'll probably not lose a whole lot of sleep if they lose games, but there's going to be a lot of, um, you know, battles, especially in the running back group between um, Huntley and Hawkins um, and some of the other positions. Um, So I think it's going to be a big preseason for the Falcons. I I know it's only three games instead of the four. So, Mm -hmm. It's going to be some football, 
and I'm going to watch it as we're if gonna it's watch. a real game. Just because and we're going to be I doing live play by play right here on the Falcoholic. <laughs> yeah, nice, so, nice plug. Um, good plug, good plug. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, um, I'm just excited for football to come back. But yeah, uh, to answer your question, I think he's going to take it pretty seriously because he is a hard ass, and that's what they need. Yeah. Um, I, I I want them to win, even though it's preseason. But more than that, I want them to stay healthy. So. Yeah, that, that the health is a big thing, and, you know, the winning is, like, fun, but at the end of the day, the actual wins don't matter. Like, if you yeah. play, if you kick ass for three quarters, and then your fourth stringers come in and lose in the fourth quarter, like, I don't give a shit. I just want to know right. that when well, you're Well, and playing, that's where the, the position yeah. battles come in. You're going to know, okay, this guy stepped up, and this guy didn't, or whatever, you know. And yeah. that plays a big part, because last year, um, they eventually added some people off the practice squad, but I don't think they had a undrafted free agent on the opening day roster. I think that's going to be different yeah. this year more because of cap probably, but also they got, they had a really good, I know we've talked about it, Kevin, mm-hmm. but a really good um, undrafted free agent class. Yeah. Um, and like J- Hawkins, who we had on the show a couple of weeks ago or a month ago, I'm tr- losing track of time. He could really make a push to mm-hmm. be in mm-hmm. the running back group. Like oh yeah opening roster so yeah i mean i think since thor hyped us up so much about javian hawkins i think i'd be surprised now if he didn't make the roster but they have they right. added some other quality edfas as well like errol thompson who we're going to talk about later mm-hmm. um and some other guys too so yeah very exciting stuff there um yeah randy what do you think do you do you care about preseason at all do you care about preseason wins or you just want them to like you know look serviceable at the to- uh, while the games are going on yeah no i don't care uh if we win preseason games um i think you know the, the, there's a reason for the preseason obviously you want to see your team on the field you want to gauge how your players are going to play in a competitive situation um under the big lights uh so yeah i, I care about it for those reasons um mm-hmm. uh i definitely um worried <laughs> a lot during the quinn era because i yeah. was like this team doesn't seem ready to play. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, there were those seasons where it's like, you know, the first four games of the regular season, I'm like, this team doesn't <laughs> seem ready to play. Yep. Yeah. That's um, like, it, it matters. Right. But like only to an extent, but if you don't reach that threshold, then it becomes concerning. Like when we went on four, like several years in a row, it was like, this is a problem now. Like, and it's not necessarily about the own four part. It's about the, like you said, the lack of preparation and this team doesn't look I, ready to play. So didn't they get up to like, zero and 10, it was like, a, I think they lost 11 straight preseason games oh, okay. under Quinn, um, which is ridiculous. Yeah. But yeah, uh, I think, uh, you know, I think if you go one and three, well, I guess it'd be one and two. Now, uh, if you go like one and two every year in the preseason, no one will care. If you go 0-3 yeah. every year, people will start to care because it's like, well, what, you know, you can't, you really can't squeeze yeah. one win well, out. Like, it's, <laughs> right. It's the every year problem because, I yeah. mean, there's been teams that started 0-4 and, and then won the Super Bowl. Like, it's not a, I think the Lions that year, they didn't win a single game, went 4-0. Yeah, they went 4-0, yeah. So if the op- remember, the opposite yeah. can be true as well. Like, you know, if you right. care too much about winning preseason games and not enough about winning, you know real games that's also a problem but uh that that seems yep. rarer that that happens <laughs> but yeah it's it that preseason win record you know i think teams that go 0 and 4 in the preseason it's generally correlated with a lower record but teams that go 4 and 0 i think is also correlated with a lower record so it's if you're like in between those two points and obviously the stats will be different now cuz there's only three games but um that's where you generally it doesn't really correlate at all so it's just uh i think a lot of super bowl teams have gone like one and three and that sort of thing in the preseason so Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's just but yeah i mean it's important to evaluate guys and it's fun to to do the play-by-play with you guys i think that's a fun thing that we do you know it's it's uh we don't have to compete with the big dogs and you know you can kind of hang out go over the game and and watch you know that's for the real nerds especially we, we won't have that fourth preseason game for like the ultra ultra diehards anymore but um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm, I'm not losing too much sleep over that one to be honest with you so um we'll be happy to to not have to call that fourth game and see absolutely no one that's going to make the roster playing for like I, more than a half i didn't even think i so i officially covered the falcons last fourth preseason game unless mm-hmm. they bring it back because i covered the lot you know obviously that's last right. year there wasn't one but the year yeah. before 
Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Good good times back when yeah. we were talking about kicker battles and yep, uh, we stuff. were we were so innocent then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, back to the defensive discussion. Um, outside of the the starting spot, I think one of the big things is like I think a lot we're hoping basically for a free agent addition. A lot of people are talking about Justin Houston. Um, I believe Melvin Ingram's still out there. I haven't been following it super closely over the last week, so it's possible he got signed. But um, I think like Melvin Ingram and, and Justin Houston are still out there. I'll pull up the the free agent list to see for sure. But Randy, did you have a name in mind of a, of a guy that's still out there that that you're hoping the Falcons will add at this point? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I mean, I don't think there's a lot of people still out there that are going to be big difference makers on the team. Um, and I, uh, I mean, there's definitely guys out there that, that, that can contribute. Um, uh, you know, that's Justin Houston. You can definitely take a look at him, but depends on price know. too, but yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how, um, how much he's going to bring to a team at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's still good last year. I think he had like seven sacks for Indy on like a pretty stacked defensive line to be fair. But you know that seven. I think that seven sacks would have led the Falcons last year. So right. you know it's right. it's not like he has a lot of competition either. So um, it's all good, the Falcons. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. So yeah, top guy available still Melvin Ingram, and I would honestly like to see if he's willing to come in here for you know four million. Maybe they could swing that. Still have some left over to carry into next season if they don't necessarily need it. That one could be interesting. Justin Houston, uh, Olivier Vernon. Uh, Trent Murphy from the Bills, Everson Griffin, who's like 34 now. Wow, I did not realize he was that old, man. That's crazy. Uh, there's and there's just a lot of like contributors, like Alex Okafor, uh, Adrian Claiborne. We could bring him back. I like, I, like, <laughs> I would, I would be into that. You know, every time yeah. he plays here, he plays well. So, yeah. I mean, he's old, but yeah, um, I, I didn't know why we like. I have, I, I was like, he's this guy's a contributor, like, yes, like, what, and it's not like he went out and made yeah. huge money. Right. Anywhere. So exactly. Yeah. Just, just good old Thomas Dimitrov not knowing how to evaluate free agent edge rushers. So, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, other than that, it is kind of it is going to be interesting to see who actually makes the roster because while the the top spots aren't necessarily settled, they have like a huge jumble of guys. Um, so some people are probably not going to make the cut. You know, I think like Fowler. Uh, Ogan DG as the draft pick, Barkevius Mingo and Jacob Twitty Mariner are probably pretty safe as those first four, but like then it's like I guess maybe Steven Means is probably the likely fifth guy, but you know, there's all the UDFAs and then the possibility of somebody else playing edge too. So um it'll be interesting to see who how that shakes out. But uh I think the depth is good. It's just the starting two spots that are a concern. Um, cause I think all those depth guys we talked about are like guys that could come in as an edge three or an edge four and you'd be like, that's fine. Yeah. But, um, if they come in as your edge one or edge two, then you're like, mm, that's not so fine. So, uh, and the problem with those guys being like an edge three or edge four is they're not far off from the talent level of the ones. I yeah. think that's the biggest problem. <laughs> yeah. Like if you had solid ones or at least like kind of solid, then it would be no big deal. But yeah, yeah, they could make a push for the starting job. Right. You know? Yeah, that's not great. Not great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So quick interlude here. We're going to go to def- the defensive interior next, guys. But uh, before that, I want to remind you guys to uh, check out the uh, Twitter for the show. It's at Falcoholic Live. Give us a follow there if you haven't yet. You can check out the community Discord. The link to that is in the show description. Uh, that's There's people still chatting in there, even during the dead zone, but definitely uh, for game days, that's a lot of fun. So check that out as we get closer and closer to the season. The Patreon is, is alive and well. We got lots of content coming out there. Uh, more stuff in the works. That is patreon.com slash Falcoholic Live. Give that a look-see as well. And then as always, guys, please do like and subscribe if you haven't already. We appreciate that. Those metrics help us on YouTube, help other people find the show. Thank you so much for that support. Um, and then we got one uh, donation, another donation from George Costanza with the $3 weighing in on the preseason debate he says preseason means zilch for about 95% of the roster. Since most of the spots are set in stone, you do have the backup battles, 
but I'd be shocked to see more than four or more, four series for uh, the first team in the entire preseason because if Ryan goes down, we're done. So we're not planning to lose stars in meaningless games. Yeah, I agree, George. The, the starters maybe play a half, you know, um, in that you know third preseason game, basically. Maybe that'll be the second preseason game now. Um, but yeah, for the most part, you're trying to shake out the bottom of the roster. And I guess this year maybe it's a little bit more exciting because the Falcons do have a lot of guys competing for those bottom of the roster spots. You know, like you usually, um, usually the, there is only like maybe four or five open spots on the whole roster with a new regime coming in. However, it's probably a little bit more open than it would normally be. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. I agree with you, George. Don't don't risk the starters more than you have to. Like you want to get them used to the game action, used to taking hits a little bit, you know, but other than that, get them out of there as fast as you can. So, um and then we got another donation here from Kevin Dog 425, one of our longest tenured patrons and longtime viewer of the show. Kevin, thanks for your support, man. Uh he says, "Kevin, tell your wife happy birthday." <laughs> Also, he is hopeful that the defense will play more confidently under Dean Pease. Uh, I agree with both of those counts. Uh, it was a great birthday. So thank you, Kevin. We appreciate that. Um, but yeah, let's uh, let's move on to the defensive interior. Uh, this is maybe, other than linebacker, like the strongest position group on the defense because the, they have an outstanding player, obviously, in Grady Jarrett. Um, but they also just have kind of a stacked group here where we're, we're looking at cutting a number of, of guys that could probably make a roster on, on most NFL teams. So obviously, like I said, Grady Jarrett's here. Uh, Tyler Davison's going to be more than likely your primary run stuffing nose tackle. Um, but then we've got last year's second round pick Marlon Davidson. We've got John Kaminsky, who is still officially listed as interior, though he, I think he might get more shot on the outside. We'll see. Uh, we have rookie Taquan Graham. We have veteran Jonathan Bullard. And then we've also got former fourth round pick Deidre Sanat. We've got another nose tackle in Olive Sagapolo, who was added recently. Uh, and I mean, the list keeps going on. Uh, John Atkins, another nose tackle they added a couple weeks ago. Um, Zach Daw, undrafted free agent. Uh, Chris Slayton, former undrafted free agent that the, the team brought back this offseason. I mean, there's just so many guys there. This actually has the potential to be a pretty strong group. Um, so, Evan, what do you think about this position group, and who do you see kind of being the the primary guys? Uh, obviously, Grady Jarrett being one, but who do you do you think it is going to be Marlon Davidson next to him on passing downs, um, or do you think it's going to be one of these other guys when the dust clears? Uh, I mean, the plan probably is for him to step up, but got to remember that this regime didn't draft him, you know. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I'm not sure what the plan is, what they have. Um, so not. I'm, I mean, I, I think I join everyone in just kind of what is going on with that. Yeah. Um, like, is he still going to be on the team? Like, will we finally see like him just unleashed and maybe it was something between the last regime and him. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, Zach Dahl, I'm really interested in. He's an undrafted guy from BYU. Um, I think he's pretty solid. It kind of brings like that flexibility where he could, if he had to play on the edge, but um, yeah, I think there's a ton of those guys because I think Bullard and um, Graham, who they drafted, is kind of the same type where they could play inside or outside. Right. right. Um, and I, I thought Davidson also played outside in college. He did. Maybe I'm yes, wrong. he stood up too. <laughs> right. <laughs> he's so, a freak. Yeah, um, he's crazy. Yeah, so maybe he plays a little outside, and they get they you know shed some more on the um, you know on the edge guys that are listed and keep more interior guys who just end up playing more on the edge i have no idea yeah, um, yeah. but yeah that's how i made it work for my roster is i put kaminsky technically mm-hmm. as like the fifth edge um and then right. you know kept another guy like i think i kept bullard as like the fifth defensive tackle or something but yeah i mean that's mm-hmm. the thing like there's there's too many guys here like people aren't they're not all gonna make the team i mean at this point i'm looking at them keeping 10 guys and we're cutting you know at least Adrian sanat and all these and all the udfas so it's, it's just mm-hmm. it's really cramped there right now that's where that's where preseason is going to be big because those guys, you know, in training camp you only see so much, but actually seeing them hitting opponents and stuff, you're going to see some some of them flash and some of them just look awful and you know yeah. that's those that's what 
uh, preseason is all about. Those kind of position battles. Yeah, yeah. Randy, what do you think about that uh, second interior spot? Do you think it is going to be Marlon Davidson? Is that who you want to see? Or are you liking one of these these newcomers uh, in that role? Yeah, I like Davidson. Um, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I haven't I haven't seen enough of of uh, anybody else to make a to make a good call there. But yeah, right. um, yeah, I do. I I, I like him, and I want to I want to see more of him. Uh, yeah, and we're gonna see what the deal with Sonata is if he's if he's out this season. It's because you know he was never good enough. But I I, I don't know. I just felt like. There was there was something going on with the last <laughs> administration for sure. Yeah. Um, but maybe it was like, you know, an issue that made sense to keep him uh limited as much as he was, or yeah. or Dan Quinn was a bad coach. <laughs> yeah. It's a controversial opinion, I know. <laughs> Hot take. Yeah. Hot take alert. But could be possible. It could possibility. Be. Yeah. Dan Quinn didn't know what the fuck he was doing. <laughs> um, yeah, strong possibility. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, I mean, honestly, you don't have to be. We don't have. We don't need the best guy in the world to be. You know, the other part of that interior line, right? Um, uh, because um, you know, you've got one of the best players and one of the best defensive mm-hmm. players in football on. on you know, on the other side of that. So it's like, okay, all you have to do is look for your opening. <laughs> yeah. You just there. have to penetrate. Yeah. You're getting, you're yeah. getting single, you're getting singled up. No question. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I agree. Um, and that's the thing, like, it's just, I don't know who to cut. Right. Cause it's like, I liked Sonat and I think he didn't get a fair shot, but it's like, I don't know how you find him a roster spot when like Grady Jerry obviously has a spot. Tyler Davison, I mean, they could move on from him. Like say like, you know, all of Sagapolo is just like awesome. And they're like, we want to keep, Sagapolo, he's a more traditional 3-4 nose tackle. We want his size more than we want Davis Davison. But, like, I, I find it hard to believe, like, they got Davison to restructure his contract and they guaranteed a lot more of his money. Like, I just think that's unlikely they're going to cut him now. So that's two guys. They're probably not cutting Taquan Graham, who they just drafted. And I just find it hard to believe that Kaminsky isn't making this team either. Um, you know, and Marlon Davidson, too. So that's that's already, you know, five guys right there with Jarrett, Graham, Davison, Davidson, and Kaminsky. That's five guys. Now, if you put Kaminsky at edge, you know, you've got another spot that you're looking to, you know, share between Jonathan Bullard, John Atkins, undrafted rookie, Zach Daw, Olive Sagapolo, Deidre Sanat, and Chris Slayton. There's like six guys fighting for maybe one defensive tackle spot. I mean, that is by far the most intense competition on the roster, I would say. So, um, it's just, yeah, like, I, I don't think Sanat got a fair shake here, but I just, I have a hard time finding a spot for him on the roster. Um, but yeah, I mean, what do you, what do you think, Evan? Do you think, who when the dust clears, do you think Sanat is on this team, or, or do you think he's he's basically looking at the door at this point? Um, Because I think he's at least, like, depth-worthy, um, I think he's on the team. I think he's even... You know, it's easy to make fun of how he hasn't really played, but he kind of has. And when he did, he kind of graded pretty well. Yeah. Um, so I think he will be. But again, a lot has changed. This is a new regime. Um, he hasn't seen much action, especially last year. So who really knows? Um, right. But he definitely has a leg up in that he's been in the system, which, you know, a new defensive coordinator and stuff like that. But I, th- I think he is on the roster, but if he's not, I obviously won't be surprised. But I just want to know what the deal's been because it's been <laughs> probably the weirdest thing about this team. It has. Just you draft a guy in the third round and then just ride him on the bench. Just like he, I don't think he could have played any better in limited action. And it's like, I mean, he sure, he could have had like a sack every time he stepped on the field. But I mean, reasonably speaking, yeah. like I think he was impressive enough to, to get more play time. And it just never well, came. Well, they, so. they would, they would uh, um, do like a healthy scratch on him or whatever. Yeah. And then he would play and he would, uh, according to PFF, be like our second, mm-hmm. you know, our, obviously not topping Grady, but right, right. our second like best interior guy or second D-line guy in general. 
um, you know, grade wise. So, and yeah. then he'd just be back to healthy scratch or uh, out with a ankle or something that, you know, it's like, okay. Yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't know what to read about this, but um, yeah. But with a new regime, maybe that becomes more clear. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Or maybe he just ends up cut and that's the end of the story. But that would be a very sad end. I would not be happy to see that, but you know, it's yeah. just, it's so stacked. Like he could have a good camp and still get cut. Like that's the thing. Like somebody is going to get cut and probably get signed <laughs> by another team, which is a weird thing for Falcons defensive lineman. But um, yeah, I mean, I just like, I know some of these guys, like I would say like all, all of Sagapolu and John Atkins are probably competing for a practice squad spot um, because like, I think Tyler Davison is unlikely to go anywhere. Like, I, I think he's a good run defender, and I think he's going to be the nose tackle this year because they've kind of backed themselves into a corner with his contract. They, they don't, they they lose a lot of money for cutting him. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. But I don't think the team is committed to him past this year at all. Um, so they'll need a nose tackle next year, and I think they would like to groom someone so they don't have to draft one. Um, and all of Psychopolu and John Atkins, two guys that, that are nose tackles, traditional three, four guys, both promising. Um, so I think those two are going to, you know, duke it out for that practice squad spot. And they'll probably just, you know, they'll be the primary backup. You know, they might get elevated to the roster if there is an injury to Tyler Davison. Um, but they'll otherwise just be kind of learning and then, you know, kind of be slated to, to take over next year. Um, but the rest of those guys, it's like one of these guys is, is going to get cut. And I, I, I hope it's not John Kaminsky. I would be really, very upset if Kaminsky leaves, because I just feel like if you can't turn his talent into something, cause it's not a work ethic thing with him at all. Like he was constantly praised for being such a high character guy and, and really working. And I think he's flashed a lot too. Like I, I, I would just be upset if he doesn't end up making the roster. So I, I would be pretty shocked if he did. But it's like, who doesn't make it? It's just that that's the interesting thing about defensive tackles. Someone's not making it. Um, and Ray, I, I think we have um, JTM, Jacob Twenty Werker. I, I think we have him kind of penciled in as an edge because that's where the team has him listed, at outside linebacker. Um, but he, he could also play some interior as well. We know he has that flexibility and, and has done that in the past. Um but yeah, defensive tackle, definitely one of the most interesting ones. Arguably the strongest on the defense from top to bottom. Um, so, you know, we'll see how how that shakes out. One of the more interesting ones to follow. Another interesting position. How about that said, guys? Um, <laughs> we'll take a look at cornerback, which I think is perhaps the most up-in-the-air position of anyone in terms of, you know, other than A.J. Terrell. <laughs> are any of the jobs set in stone? I don't think so. Um, so... Let me read you guys off who the team has right now. So we've got AJ Terrell, obviously. He's going to be the corner one. Um, Then we have Fabian Moreau, uh, who seems to be the heavy favorite right now to be the outside guy opposite all uh, opposite AJ Terrell. But you know we'll have to see what happens in camp. We've also got uh, former second rounder Isaiah Oliver, who seems to be the the starting slot guy right now. Um, We have. Two draft picks in Darren Hall, who was a fourth rounder, and Avery Williams, who was the sixth rounder. Uh, Williams, more of a special teams guy. Hall, a versatile guy. Uh, we also have a smattering of. Uh, uh, we also have Kendall Sheffield still here uh, from the previous regime. <laughs> still here. Still here. Um, <laughs> and you know, in case you forgot about him, I think I forgot about him on my first roster projection. So you know. Just reminding folks, he is still here. Uh, we have a couple of interesting undrafted guys from last year in Tyler Hall and Delrick Abrams, who both stuck around. Uh, there's also Chris Williamson. And uh, we have TJ Green listed as a defensive back, but he's more of a safety, so I don't think he's really factoring into the corner competition. But, uh, Randy, if you had to pick right now, I mean, who are you looking at as the outside guy? Do you like Fabian Moreau there, or are you hoping it's one of the rookies that ends up stepping up and taking that job? Um, yeah, I don't know, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I grinded the Fabian Moreau tape so you didn't have to, so I don't I don't blame you for not watching his, like, 100 snaps over the past two years, but, yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you know... Um... Uh, yeah, not a lot <laughs> there yeah. to, to to figure out, you know, if he can actually be <clears throat> that guy. Um, 
yeah, I mean, I'm 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 hoping it's one of the rookies. <laughs> yeah. Um uh and that um that we've had a you know a good draft and that and that one of these guys is gonna be you know the guy. Um I obviously like Dean Pease is like amazing and um I'm not terribly worried about um uh picking the wrong guy because I feel like scheme wise we're gonna be able to like adjust to what's going on and I feel like we're actually going to have a team where um the players are schemed to play to their strengths. Yeah. And that we're not gonna have people come in and go like, no, do this thing that you've never done before. Um and that you're not good at. Um, yeah, Isaiah that, Oliver. Yeah, why player. don't you be line the, up on Tyreek Hill? Yeah, that's a good yeah, idea. Be, be, yeah, be yeah. the player that we want you to be and not the player that you are. Um and fit yourself into our scheme and don't um you know like don't take into consideration like what this what this player's strengths and weaknesses are. Yeah. Not that a player can't get better at something right. that they're weak right. at, but I mean like start be simple um so uh yeah yeah i mean that might be the biggest key right overall it could be that it's not necessarily that the players are drastically better it's that they're used drastically better um and you know i think that dean pease like once raheem morris took over the, the team did get a little bit better about that um and you know the blitzing picked up and they were able to kind of overcome some of their shortcomings in the second half of the season i think over the second half of the season once raheem morris took over they were actually like a fringe top 20 defense you know which for the falcons is a big deal (laughs) so um so like you know i think that we're gonna see this defense look a lot more like raheem morris's defense um and dps i think will be better um i don't know that he has exactly what he wants to work with this year they're probably gonna have to cobble it together a little bit um but if anyone could i mean dean pease doesn't really have bad defenses i mean he's had some middling ones um but even his like quote unquote bad defense in tennessee they were still like a good defense in terms of scoring i mean they allowed a ton of yards but like they were still like a top 18 defense in terms of scoring even his like one of his worst years so he just seems to always get it done um he doesn't always have an elite defense but i think the fact that he's kind of always been able to cobble together something competent is very encouraging. And um, that might be all that they need, right? Like if they could just get a top 20 defense consistently and not be like the 32nd defense, <laughs> like if the, if the offense is as good as, as it should be, then maybe that's enough for them to be competitive week in and week out. So uh, we'll see. We'll see. But yeah, I mean, Evan, what do you think about that cornerback group there? Um, you know, are you confident in Moreau on the outside? Do you want it to be Darren Hall? Do you want one of these other guys to get a shot? I mean, how are you feeling there? Yeah, I think it's going to be Moreau and then Oliver play inside. Um, I like De- De- uh, Delrick Abrams a lot. Um, I don't know how far he's listed down yeah, the Yeah, he's huge. Chart, but he's like 6'3". Yeah, yeah, right. I like the size there. Um Tyler Hall, I also like. He was an undrafted free agent last year who got some playing time and got burnt a lot, but obviously he was thrown to the wolves. Oh, yeah. And that's who I was think I was thinking of when you guys were talking about using players properly. I I could be making this up, but I remember I think it was the Will Fuller game. Yeah. Um yeah. where he like went just bonkers and they just like threw Tyler Hall out there to like just like insane stuff that just wasn't working. Um and that's what we saw a lot, you know, last year yeah. and probably you could say other years. But hopefully now, I mean, they're they're a young group overall. Um, not a lot of veterans there, but um, I don't know. We'll see what happens. I, I think what will make their job easier is if there's actually a pass rush this year. Um, there's nothing worse than playing corners and you have literally no pass rush. Right. And that's that would make it harder for them. So I think that's going to play into it big. Yeah. And that's what we talked. I think a couple of weeks ago, we talked about, you know, the possibility of them bringing in Brian Poole with the money from the Julio Jones trade because mm. you know, he is a great yeah, it could corner, be arguably the best. Not on here. Um, and, you know, the best blitzing corner in the NFL as well, which is something that Pease just loves to do is to throw in those blitzes from, from elsewhere. So I, I would be interested in seeing if, you know, maybe we, we've talked a lot about edge because I think that's probably where it's more needed, quote unquote. But I think pool could also be a great addition if, if they go that direction. Um, so, you know, we'll see if they do spend any of this money. It's entirely possible they 
they've been very committed to this idea of let's get out of this salary cap problem and just eat it because they haven't really made any commitments into 2022 with most of these free agents. So um, it could be that this is a very like a strategy that they're very committed to, um, to the extent that they're willing to just kind of keep this money and use it next year, you know, and, and try to keep as much of it as they can roll it over. You know, the, if, if they keep all of it, they could end up rolling over like 7 million into 2022. And obviously that could go a long way into helping out. What is it? A dicey cap situation. It's not going to be as bad as this year because COVID's not a thing. Um, but you know, it, it's still going to be tight next year. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how committed they are to keeping all of that money. Um, but yeah, the big thing for me is, you know, speaking of Kendall Sheffield, like I've left him off my roster projection so far, just because I don't know, like if they keep five corners, you know, if they keep five safeties, five corners, I know Dean Pease likes to play a lot of three safeties. So I, I was like, you know, leaning maybe towards keep fifth safety. They keep five corners. Like, I don't know if Sheffield's making this roster because if you've got AJ Terrell, Moreau, Isaiah Oliver, and then the two rookies, that's five right there. So, um, you know, Evan, what do you think about that? You know, is there a chance Kendall Sheffield is on the bubble at this point? I think it's fair to say. Uh, uh, last year was a little rough. I thought his rookie season was okay. Yeah. Um, but, again, this is a regime that has no, you know, attachment to him. They didn't draft him or anything like that. They haven't coached him yet. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to say a lot of people are on the bubble who have been starters or played a significant amount of time in past years. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, so we'll, we'll see, we'll see what happens there. Uh, very interesting. And, you know, at this point it's entirely speculation because in case you guys haven't noticed, you know, we haven't seen any of these players yet. (laughs) We haven't been to the OTAs. Uh, we were not invited. So (laughs) very few people were, I think the media was only invited to like two or three OTA sessions, like total. So, no one's really seen more than a flash of these guys, and this is all just speculation, as I'm sure you guys know. But uh, we will hopefully have more information coming in hot when we get to training camp, which we still don't know when that is. But the Panthers announced when their training camp is going to be today, so hopefully we'll hear in the next couple days when that will be uh, starting off for the Falcons. Probably the last week of July, possibly the first week of August. Uh, this seems to be the, the consensus, so we'll we'll see. But um, cornerback, one of the biggest question marks for sure. Um, The rest of the spots, I think, are pretty much, like, settled. Um, You know, inside linebacker, there's some maybe some interesting stuff in terms of the last guy. But, I mean, I think, like, it's probably going to— Obviously, Deion Jones and Foye Oluwokan are going to be the top two guys. Michael Walker, the number three guy, maybe playing some edge as well, some Sam-type stuff. Um, but then it's, it's pretty much open. You know, we've got Brandon Copeland as the veteran who I think is kind of going to be the primary, uh, backup and maybe undrafted free agent Errol Thompson as kind of the, uh, you know, road grader sort of, uh, traditional old school middle linebacker that's going to fly in there, shed blocks and, and be your sort of goal line and short yardage guy. Apparently he's great on special teams too. So I'm interested about that. Um, but there's just not a lot else going on with that group i mean there's uh one other undrafted free agent linebacker and dorian etheridge who is going to obviously factor in but i mean i I think it's it's pretty much cut and dry there and then at safety again you know there's there's only i think seven safeties on the roster or something like that so um you know deron Harmon, richie grant eric harris uh are the three top guys they're all pretty much safe and then uh, Jalen Hawkins probably still keeping a roster spot as a former fourth rounder, but you know, I guess Dwayne Johnson uh, Jr., who has a great name, uh, yeah, the baby he had a couple picks uh, in a practice, so maybe he's someone to keep an eye on. Uh, and then TJ Green has been someone who's flashed previously in, in his other stops in the NFL, someone that I think you know people should keep an eye on uh, if they decide to keep a fifth safety. But again, you know, that group is, is fairly settled as well, so um not necessarily is jr much. pace a safety or is he yes a he's listed as a safety he is oh okay from northwestern yeah um haven't watched him so i can't really comment on on yeah i, I don't know much about him or uh, marcus murphy i think it's also a safety yeah yeah so we'll we'll see what happens there you know they're probably looking for some practice squad guys in that group as well yeah um, but that's we'll, pra- uh that's what preseason's for exactly it, but that's when you distance your, you know, you hate to 
say it, but your teammates are your kind of your competition during yeah, that time. Like, it is those yeah. guys you're trying to, you know, beat out. So yep, yep, it's a harsh business, man. It is. Yeah. So, um, yeah, guys, uh, that's pretty much the 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 gist of the uh, the defense. Oh no, battles. special teams. Oh uh, well, special teams. We got that's gonna get its own episode, man. Yeah. That's oh, what we get. okay, okay. I'll yeah. save my uh, punter takes. There you go. Yes, yeah, save those fiery punter takes for next time. But uh, before we <laughs> before we wrap things up, guys, want to uh, read off George Costanza's final donation for three dollars. George, thanks again, man. We appreciate you. He says, uh, "I wish the NFL would expand the rosters after Week 13. Let teams carry like 75 players, like the MLB does. But you know, after the 53rd player, salary doesn't count. So like similar to the top 51 rule that they have now. Um, that way, you can let teams evaluate what they have for the next season in real game time." Yeah, I mean, I honestly don't see the problem with expanding rosters. There's, like, a ton of free agents always on the market. Um, so I guess I, I don't, you know, I think the 53, especially if they keep adding games like they're planning to do, um, you know, I think it's going to need to come up to 55 at least. And I think it will come up to 55 very shortly. I think this kind of practice squad elevate two guys sort of thing is just kind of a precursor to the 50, it becoming 55 people on the roster. But um, Plus, they expanded the... Is yeah. it still expanded? Yeah, the I, I think squad? they're gonna. I think they're gonna continue adding more practice squad slots they, over the next few should. years too. Yeah, so I think it's gonna end up being like twelve practice squad slots over the next couple of years. Um, but yeah, so I agree, George. I mean, I don't really see the point in in limiting rosters. You know, I if it was me, I would just abolish the practice squad and just let them all be on the roster. But NFL teams don't want to pay them a full salary. That that's why they won't do that. So, um, you know, it's not like they need the money. <laughs> but they, they still won't do it so um but yeah guys thanks for tuning in tonight we appreciate you guys hanging out with us in the midst of the dead zone obviously not much going on in terms of actual news but we can still get excited about training camp talk about a few things and do it with a tremendous guest friend of the show randy havens he's on twitter at mr randy havens randy any final falcons takes anything else you'd like to share with the people before we sign off tonight uh, looking forward to the to the new season, to the new coach, to the new GM. Um, uh, really hoping we turn this fucker around. <laughs> yes, we haven't. We didn't get your record posi- uh, prediction for this year. So, how? What are you feeling right now? What's What's your record prediction? Got to go. Yeah, seventeen games. You're going seventeen and 0, seventeen baby. and zero, baby. Yeah. Well, who, yeah, I think it was uh Dan the Man or something like that in the chat. You know, said uh they were going to go 14 and three and Eric was like, Oh, if they go 14 and three, I'll get a tattoo, you know? So, uh, we're still tracking that. Oh yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah. yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that one. But Randy, thanks again for coming on, man. Always a pleasure to have you on. Uh, thank you for having me on. Yeah. Friend of the show. Randy. Friend of the show at this point. Yeah. I mean, we've best, yeah. best friend of someone's like best friend of the show. But I would, I think show, so. Randy yeah. Maybe. Yeah, you're going to have to duke that out with Keenan. You know, you guys are, are duking it out for the title of best friend. But why can't you well, have two best friends, like, you know? Yeah, like, he's I'm like, like our, our actor <laughs> of the show. Yeah, and yeah. Keenan's our former player best friend of the show. Yeah, yeah. We got – everybody has their niche, you know. So, uh, mm-hmm. but yeah, thanks again, Randy. We appreciate you, man. Um, yeah, thank you. We also have with thanks, us, of course – Thanks to the chat. Yes, big thanks to the chat. <laughs> big ups, big ups, guys. Like and subscribe, you know, all those good YouTube things. Uh, I'll sit with this. Evan Birchfield, Director of Guest Personnel, uh, at Evan Birchfield on Twitter. Evan, anything else you're working on? Anything you'd like to plug? I, I've yet to see a pay raise from that title. but Yeah, I don't know. That, yeah, Dave, you know, he's he's the one that handles that. So, yeah. I you know, know. Sometimes title is just a title, I guess, in this yeah. business. So, yeah. Um, nothing really plug. Like and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Um, follow the Instagram, the underscore Falcolic. Um, follow me on Twitter at Evan Birchfield and just go to Falcolic.com and read our stuff. Yep. Yep. We're, st- we're still putting and follow, out three. Follow Randy. Oh, yeah. Follow of, Randy. Best too. friend of the show. Randy. Yeah. Why exactly. are you following me? <laughs> I do you, follow do you. you tweet? No, I know you. I know you are. I'm asking everyone who's not. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why. I mean, haven't you seen him? He he's been in some great films and great shows. So yeah, guys. I mean, if you're not following, and he didn't pay me to say that either. No, no, that was just that was 100 percent genuine. Payment was uh, like you had to say that first, then you. Yes, yeah. The Venmo hasn't gone through yet. Right. So technically, Evan wasn't lying. Yeah, Yeah. he was. He has not been paid to say that that payment was conditional. 
Yes, exactly. Right, the payment coming is through. on the way now. It is sent. I just clicked the button. So thank you, Evan, for that. You're yeah. welcome. Yep. But uh, <laughs> yeah, guys, check out Evan on Twitter as well. He also runs the Falcons Instagram page. So check that out as well. Uh, notably followed by, you know, the Falcons uh, official accounts as well, apparently. So <laughs> mm. apparently. <laughs> apparently, yeah. But uh, that's a topic for another show. Uh, but guys, I'm mm-hmm. Kevin Knight at Falcoholic Kevin on Twitter. Um, Again, check out thefalcoholic.com. Follow the show at Falcoholic Live. Check out the Discord if you're into that stuff. Uh, check out the Patreon for sure. Um, like I said, we're working on some long-term plans there to get some more patron-exclusive content. We're also going to be having a patron-exclusive uh, fantasy football league. Uh, we may have another open league just for everyone. Um, if if I don't know if I can run it just because I'm already having to run like four or five leagues. But if someone else wants to run it that works for the Falcon Live, then we might have another league. But uh, otherwise, uh, it's going to be a patron league. So uh, definitely, if you're interested in that, you can hit that up. And there's also, of course, other exclusive content and our eternal gratitude that's on offer as well. So uh, check that out, guys. But again, thank you for hanging out with us tonight. Um, We will see you guys in two weeks. Next week, I am also occupied doing some other uh stuff for family so i won't be able to do that and also there's nothing to talk about so it ends up working out nicely there but um we'll be back for the rest of july as we ramp up for training camp as you guys know we are planning to go and cover training camp um hopefully the first week but we'll see in terms of availability when we can get credentials and all that stuff so stay tuned for that um and we'll just get right into that coverage and preseason and then the season so we're, we're almost there you know, not too much longer. One more month, basically, until the dead zone's over. And it'll be full full blast football content from then on out, guys. So until next time, I'm Kevin Knight. For my co-host, Evan Birchfield, and friend, best friend of the show, Randy Havens. Thank you, guys. Have a great night. We'll see you next time. <laughs>